Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And we are back at it with our ancient Egyptian series. Hey, welcome back. It's time. Let's gather around the river. You know, I feel like a nice picnic out by the river with like cocktails and maybe a cheese board is kind of the vibe that I'm going for. Oh, yeah, I'm so into that. I'm picturing reeds. I'm sure Egypt has lots of different kinds of biomes, but the ones I'm picturing are like those beautiful kind of like, you know, uh, tailed like grasses growing in the yeah. sort of like brackish water. Love it. I love that. It's beautiful. We will avoid the crocodiles. But Amanda, there's a bird over there. What kind of bird is that? Oh, is that a, is that a crane? It kind of looks like a crane. Amanda, I think that might be an ibis. Oh. And that's very fitting today. I did not I didn't plan any of that. I was just like, wait, hold on. We can get there. Go for it. Go for it. Nailed it. So we are talking today about the god Thoth, who is the ibis-headed god, the god of wisdom, writing, science, and my personal favorite, secret knowledge. Ooh, I love this combination of stuff. It's a real predecessor to the, uh, I feel like this was like an early 2010s um, trend of not just STEM, but STEAM. Got to put the arts in there, Julia. Got to put the arts in there. And we will talk about that. Got to be able to write. You're you're kind of right on the money as per usual. Ooh. We've only been doing this for how many years? You're always right on the money. I love it. You got to give me some context clues, but I, I can follow you down the, the winding river here. I love it. So he is also not only all of those things, also a lunar deity and is very much associated with the moon. Cool. Not the only lunar deity I should mention. Uh, the ancient Egyptians had several lunar deities, but we will get to that towards the end of this episode. Great. We'll be referring to him as Thoth through this entire episode, but that was actually a name that was given to him by the Greeks and not the Egyptians. What do the Egyptians call him? The Egyptians referred to him as Jahuti, uh, but he definitely became more popularized, especially in like modern understandings of him as Thoth. So that is what we're going to refer to him in this episode. I just thought it was worth sharing that like colonialism struck early and struck hard and it's it's good to like realize that. Indeed. So, as I mentioned before, he is the ibis-headed god. And for those of you who don't know, an ibis is kind of like a, it's a long-legged wading bird. It would, you know, usually be in low bodies of water. Uh, they've got long beaks. Uh, they're kind of like egrets, or as you pointed out, Amanda, like cranes, if I had to compare them to another bird. Um, and Thoth was more specifically associated with the African sacred ibis, which was, of course, sacred because of its association with Thoth. Cool. Which you're just like, okay, ornithologists, I see you. I, you that makes sense. <laughs> We've talked about how sometimes they are uh, over-enthusiastic ornithologists, uh, but we we respect a obvious name. Yes. And, you know, like these are also the, the nomenclature that we know them from. You know, they have scientific names as well. But I was like, well, yeah, that would be the sacred ibis because it was worshipped. Makes mm -hmm. sense. Checks out. I also must say I really identify with the uh, the wading birds because like them, uh, I'm not often caught flying. And like them, my legs are too long for my fairly football shaped body. Uh, and so that that really just makes me feel of a kind with these long beaked loves. Never heard anyone refer to their body as football shaped, but it makes sense. Yeah. But you're not wrong. Yeah. But yeah, I just I try to kind of up. And the, like, uh, toxic sort of diet culture, apple pear shaped. Yeah. Hourglass. I, I try yeah. to throw in just kind of like different things now and again, just to poke fun at the, the whole concept of it. Yeah. It's like trying to write about like people's hair color in romance novels. And you're like, you guys got to mix it up a little bit. Raven haired and Auburn. Come on. Give me something new. Give me something yeah. exciting. Or any white author describing a black character. Like, my guy, you just don't use a food. Just, just don't just, use a food. There's lots of. Lots of wonderful ways and colors of brown. You yeah. can just describe it. So not only was Thoth depicted as ibis-headed and sometimes even just like fully ibis at points, but he was also referred to as a, quote, beautiful baboon. The, uh, oh, I don't know exactly what that would look like in my mind. Uh, I assume just like the platonic ideal of a baboon. Now, Julia, are baboons the one that have very distinctive butts? Yes, I believe so. There might be a Listen. specific species of baboon. I'm not entirely sure, but baboon. Might be your thing. Not mine, but... Uh, shout out to, I guess, whatever scholar referred to as beautiful baboon as opposed to uh, 
just regular baboon. I mean, also, to be fair, I am thinking sexy baboon, which is not not the word that was used here. It could just be like a very, you know, photogenic and like cute and just distinguished looking baboon, which like there are definitely some, you know, primates that are like, dang, okay, this is beautiful. I can see where we came from with this baboon. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. This baboon identification, it particularly comes from Middle Kingdom on. But if you're looking at an image of Thoth and the ibis head or the baboon head does not give it away, you can usually identify him by the fact that he holds the Wedjat eye, which is the eye of Horus, uh, which is something that we will talk about in the Horus episode and why Thoth is associated with that a little bit later. But... Because of his aforementioned association with the moon, he is often also seen wearing either a crescent representing the new moon or a disc representing the full moon. Nice. Additionally, as the god of wisdom and writing, he can often be found holding a papyrus scroll and a writing utensil. Pays to be prepared. There are many times in my life where I'm glad I carry a sharpie at all times, and I'm glad that Thoth sort of shares that with me. Yes, well, Thoth has a particular reason why he needs to be constantly carrying a papyrus roll. We'll talk about it a little bit, but there's a reason for it. But where did Thoth come from? I really like that researcher Sally tends to break down these two, uh, this like origin section into two different categories. We have like mythological origins for the gods, but we also have historical origins for the gods. And it's just something that I've noticed she's been doing in these episodes. And it makes me very happy. Shout out Sally. And shout out patrons for helping us pay. Sally and Bren. Yes. So let's start with the mythological origin. So the mythological origin also gives a reason as to why Thoth has two so distinct forms. Because a baboon and an ibis, not very similar creatures in my mind. No, and there are a couple of different gods you talked about in the Egyptian series that have, you know, it's not just like, oh, a crow and an ibis or a, you know, alligator or a snake. Like, they, they're very different. And it's almost making me wonder, is it like a, you know, state bird, state tree, state flower situation where sort of different parts of the animal and bird kingdom have different representatives or just two distinct stories? So I'm excited to learn. Well, this one I can give you a reason for right away. It was said that Ra, in giving birth to Thoth, because you have to remember that Ra basically is the progenitor of all of the gods, um, he created the baboon form to be the one that shines in the night sky. So again, tying that to the moon representation for Thoth, while the ibis form of Thoth was to act as a messenger between heaven and earth, literally flying back and forth. Okay, that makes sense. Now I'm picturing, and I'm sure this isn't what they meant, but now I'm picturing the moon as the baboon's butt, and that's very funny to me. Um, I also pictured that, or maybe like a uh, like a halo in like medieval Christian art. You know how it's just like a disc behind the saint or Jesus? Yeah, very fun. I like that a lot. So he also has several other origin stories that basically it depends on the time period, which makes sense, especially when we were talking about like the different representations of Ra and how they reflected the like political landscape of the time that those stories were being told, as you as you might remember from our Ra episode. So one story says that Thoth was born, quote, from the lips of Ra and was immediately given the task of upholding Ma'at, which was the divine order that we talked about in our most recent episode. And another story is one that I'm sure we'll talk about more in a future episode, but it reminds me so much of the origins of Athena. Kinda. You'll see what I mean. Really? Thoth was said to have sprung from the forehead of the god Set after Set (sighs) swallowed some of the semen of his rival god Horus. Okay. It was on some lettuce, too. I don't know if that makes it better or worse. Much worse, Julia. Oh, interesting. I don't know about you. Again, if it's your thing, I love that for you. But for me, I'm not mixing foods with any bodily emissions I may or may not ingest. Fair, fair. Interesting, interesting. A much later story, where we'll just go skip past the the semen thing. Uh, A much later story, after the Greeks arrived, uh, they believed that he was basically worshipped as this self-creating deity who was said to have produced a cosmic egg from which he himself was born. I mean, that's very cool. I I love a like self, you know, self reproductive uh, or like outside the gender binary uh, God. Like, that's awesome. That also feels very Greek to me, that kind of like weird cyclic philosophy nonsense where they're like, well, it's a real chicken and the egg situation, except now it's thought that he, you know, gave birth to himself, basically. 
You know, I think I think certain areas of philosophy, you do get kind of so far up your own um, Ouroboros that you then do end up producing yourself. Man, our show is explicit. You can say butthole. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to make it a little classier. That's fair. That's fair. So the historical origins in terms of Thoth uh, get a little bit cloudier. Um, archaeologists and scholars believe that Thoth had great importance early on in the history of ancient Egypt as a celestial god. Uh, again, this was the focus early on was his relationship with the moon, and it wasn't until later that he became primarily associated with writing and knowledge, which I think in a lot of ways does make sense, just if you're thinking about kind of the creation and origin stories of any culture, um, you're going to start with, oh, we can see the stars, we can see the sun, we can see the moon. And then as you develop like more of a written language and a spoken language and like mathematics and science and philosophy, you're going to assign another god to that. Totally. Now, the earliest depictions in art that we have of Thoth date back to the Old Kingdom, and they show him as one of two companions that would cross the sky on Ra's sunboat, the other being Ma'at. And we already know how important she was even to the early ancient Egyptians. Oh, yeah. So putting him aside, Ra, literally the, the king god, and Ma'at, who is the divine order, he has extreme importance in those early depictions. But his importance and primary function among the gods definitely solidified later on as he grew more into that role of writing and knowledge. And because it is Thoth who is said to observe and write down everything that happened. And I do mean everything. Like a historian or like a record keeper of, you know, sunrise, agricultural, rainfall, all of that? Well, he was both a scribe and a historian. Cool. Which is very important. And you mentioned you're like, yeah, I always carry a Sharpie with me. Thoth was never not writing shit down. <laughs> I feel like a lot of historians' jobs would be easier if historians were also the scribes. Of being like, hey, 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 so many hundreds of years from now, you're going to want to know uh, these important historical things that might otherwise sort of get like left aside or out of the record. Yeah, facts. I, I think he's he's so interesting. And it's like his role is so pivotal. So like basically he's constantly observing and writing everything down. And then it's also his job to report to Ra every single morning. Here's what you missed. Oh, boy. <laughs> Which is an extremely important role. You know, um, he also, as I mentioned in the Ma'at episode, he is this like divine example of a just judge. And he was said to be incorruptible. Cool. Like it is so important because this allows him to play this dual role of both the gracious peacemaker when the situation calls for it, as well as this kind of like merciless executioner. And as we know from history, you know, who writes what down and for what purpose has a, a stunning effect on how we understand the period in those events. Mm -hmm. And so you really want a just, you know, neutral judge doing your writing, in my opinion. Yeah. And, you know, Thoth is this basically this officer that is upheld as the like high example. And Ma'at really doesn't work as a concept if you like believe that humans are corruptible and the gods are corruptible. So having him be this like incorruptible mm -hmm. judge allows like Ma'at to really exist. If he wasn't, it wouldn't work, you know? Makes total sense. He only serves Ma'at, both the concept of Ma'at and also his wife who embodies the concept, which I really like. We, we, we stand a, <laughs> a wife guy in ancient Egyptian mythology. We do. The Egyptians also credited him as the author of all works of science, religion, philosophy, and magic because he was said to channel through those who created or studied those things. Very cool. And I love that for writers to be like, mm, I'm really feeling Thoth with me today. Yes. It's like, you know, we're going to talk about the muses in future episodes and yes. stuff, but I am really inspired by that. We were like, oh, yeah, it's like the divine inspiration is moving through me. In this case, it's Thoth and these like, you know, science and math magics and stuff. It's really cool. And you asked Amanda, was Thoth a historian or a scribe? All Egyptian scribes were known as followers of Thoth. Hey, I love that. Isn't that amazing? I love that so much. So as the god of sciences, Thoth was said to have been the creator of arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and medicine, 
and is even credited with the invention of the 365-day calendar. So we have him to blame for this weird-ass calendar we've got. Well, Amanda, I'm going to tell you the story of the origin of that calendar after the, the break later, but get ready for it. It's a good one. Okay, good. I also mentioned he is the patron of medicine. He's not alone in that domain. Uh, Sekhmet, Heka, Isis, they were all patrons of medicine as well, but much more in the kind of like healing way. Soth was associated with the complexity of learning about the human body and learning medicine. And so it was also his role to safeguard the goddess Isis during her pregnancy as well as restoring Horus's stolen eye, which is a nod to mm. why the Wedjot eye is associated with his image, and a story that we will tell in either the Isis or the Horus episode, I promise. <laughs> so early on in his worship, he also became associated with the god Osiris, who we will, again, talk about in a future episode. But mainly what you need to know about Osiris is that he is intrinsically tied to the understanding of the afterlife. Now, Thoth was said to serve and protect Osiris, which explains his role in the afterlife trial. So basically, he plays a really important role in a mortal's afterlife, uh, though the role has changed over the years. Uh, starting with early on in the pyramid text, it was said that dead kings would fly up to the heavens on the wings of Thoth. Again, hearkening back to that story that I told earlier about his ibis form being mm -hmm. created by Ra to act as a messenger between heaven and earth. And are ibises big enough to carry a person or this is sort no, of a... No, uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's, he, he a big ibis? <laughs> okay. <laughs> they, they look kind of small. Yeah, they're like, I want to say like turkey size is probably the equivalent. Well, you know, in, in afterlife math and physics, it's all fine. Yeah, I, I don't think a grown man could ride a turkey into heaven, but... I bet Ben, ben Franklin would have tried. He would have tried. And maybe the soul uh, or weight of a heart that is, you know, the same weight as a certain feather would actually work. Yeah, that's a good point, Amanda. Good point. So in the Middle Kingdom, the mansion of Thoth was said to provide a safe haven for spirits who could, like, use his magic and magic charms to get past the creatures of the underworld that stood in their way. Again, like, we talk about the afterlife, and it was very much a, like, very physical trial for the the mortals that were passing into it. They had to, like, go through it in order to get to the trial in the first place and, you know, receive the afterlife that they deserve. So... Thoth had this mansion on the road to the trial where they could stop and like have a little rest there and have a nice time. Like a great rest stop with a local coffee chain, a fast food place of your choosing and great bathrooms. Or like a, a dungeon crawler where it's like, oh, I can restock on my supplies halfway through here. Thanks, Hades, the game. <laughs> exactly. So the New Kingdom tells how Thoth presides over the mystical reunion of Ra and Osiris, which allows the dead to reawaken each night and make their journey into the underworld, kind of what I just described before. But most notably is his role in the Book of the Dead, where Thoth stands ready to record the verdict when the heart of the deceased is weighed. That's probably the image that you've seen the most of him. He is standing there ready to write down whether the heart is equal, lighter, or heavier than the feather of Ma'at. Very cool. Now, those who feared failure who feared that their heart would weigh heavier than Ma'at's feather, could appeal to Thoth and ask him to plead for them the way he once pleaded for Osiris. Again, more of that later in the Osiris episode. But all funerary spells that you can find written in funerary texts were said to be written by Thoth, as he is said to have also written the 42 books that contained all of the knowledge needed by humanity. Only 42? Only 42. Wow. It's, it, he really like narrowed it down to the 42 books because later on an Egyptian historian named Manetho claimed that Thoth wrote 36,525 books. That sounds more like all the things you need to know to live, but uh, that's incredible. Yes. And so if you were, were interested in learning this information, the, the 42 books that contained all of the knowledge that humanity needed, you would have to become an initiate of Thoth because there's a lot of like occult information in there, like magic information. Uh, and so sure. by becoming an initiate, it was in order to ensure that you didn't misuse the power and the knowledge that was given to them. That makes sense. And something that, Julia, I think society would benefit from if we thought a little bit more about, like, just because we can apply computing to this process, should we? Mm, probably not. Gotta, That's like, gonna be learn the wisdom before you, like, get to use the tool. 
I've read enough Michael Crichton books knowing that, like, just because we have the technology doesn't mean we should use it. Yeah. Uh, Harkening back real quick to that 36,525 books. Wait, Julia, that's the number of days in a year. 365.25. Yes, correct. It is. Shit. It's really interesting because all of those books that were said to have been written by Thoth resided in what they called the Houses of Life, which were basically just the libraries that could be found inside temple complexes. Very cool. I just love the phrase Houses of Life to refer to a library as. That's my hot take. That's incredible. And uh, as a child, I wept real and bitter tears when I learned about the fire at the Library of Alexandria. So let's uh, let's move on real quick before I start getting myself back to that headspace. That's fair. That's fair. Uh, how about we take our refill and then when we get back, we will talk about some of the foundational stories of Thoth as well as his relationships with some of the other gods. Let's do it. Hello, hello, everybody. It's Amanda. Welcome here to the refill. And welcome to Alexander Goya, who upgraded their pledge from our $4 tier, which gets you bonus urban legends every dang month, as well as our behind the scenes notes, recipe cards, director's commentary, to the $8 tier, which has all that plus ad free episodes. We appreciate you so much. And if you want to join Alexander, if you want to be thanked here in the mid roll in the refill of spirits, I actually have a new, uh, incentive for you, which I am tying along with my recommendation this week, which is a wonderful, very sweet, queer YA novel called The No Girlfriend Rule by Kristen Randall. Now, it came out last month, and I loved, loved this story. It was so sweet. It was so cute. It's about a teen who is not included in her boyfriend's D&D campaign because of the aforementioned No Girlfriend Rule, so it finds one of her own with a bunch of other misfits, and uh, it's incredibly cute. I loved it so much that I want to send my copy, my advanced reader copy, to a randomly drawn patron. So go ahead and I'm going to say on May 1st, I'm going to draw that name. So if you are a patron or if you join between now and the 1st of May 2024, May Day, we love unions, we love D&D, etc., you will be entered for a chance to win my copy of the book. I'll put a cute little note in there. It'll be great. So if you want to join Alexander and our supporting producer-level patrons, Alicia, Ann, Ariana, Ginger, Spurs, Boy, Hannah, Jack, Marie, Jane, Measlekins, Lily, Matthew, Phil, Fresh, Rico, Like, Captain Jonathan, Malachi, Cosmos, Sarah, and Scott, or our legend-level patrons, Audra, Bex, Chibi, Okai, Jeremiah, Morgan H, Sarah, and BMF Scotty, you can do it at patreon.com slash spirits podcast. Speaking of D&D, I have so much fun every dang week releasing Join the Party, the actual play podcast we make here, Multitude with me and Julia as players, that is tangible worlds, genre-pushing storytelling, and collaborators who make each other laugh each week. Now, if the fact that uh, several hundred people came to our Rolling Bones live show tour for spirits, stayed, listened, and joined the party, and thought, hell yeah, dude, I want to listen to that. Is it enough to get you to try the show? I don't know what is. If you don't know how to play D&D, we teach you. We play all other kinds of role-playing games as well. It's so much fun. It's so sweet. It really just, like, takes you somewhere else for an hour each week. And can't we all use that? So check out Join the Party in your podcast app or go to jointhepartypod.com. We are sponsored this week by Brooklinen, where their 10-year anniversary sale includes 25% off everything from bestsellers to bundles to new arrivals. Now, listen, we've been partners with Brooklyn in four, I think going on four years. And I like them because A, they're really sweet people to work with. B, they are based here in Brooklyn. And C, they're the best sheets I've ever used. I sleep exclusively on Brooklyn. And, but here's the thing, folks. Their uh, cutest styles, their their coolest patterns, some of their like linen and other sorts of like interesting kinds of sheets don't always go on sale. I sleep exclusively in Brooklyn and tank tops because they are so comfortable. They rarely go on sale. So you are going to want to go ahead and check them out. They honestly make the perfect gift in-laws parents a maybe younger sibling who's moving out on their own get them like really nice sheets there's no better time to shop brooklinen's home essentials than now during their 10-year anniversary sale shop 25 percent off site-wide and up to 45 percent off bundles in store and online at brooklinen.com that's b-r-o-o-k-l-i-n-e-n.com 
And finally, the show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Now, there is a lot I would do with another hour in my day. I think I would spend more time, probably I'd have to resist the temptation to, you know, do errands and other things that I might find productive. But honestly, the thing that I would like to be the most free to do is just just be, do something unplanned, lounge, read, putter around with my plants, go on a walk, uh, spend time uh, on the phone with my sister, you know, instead of us running kind of and chatting with each other in between all of our other errands from like six hours uh, removed. That would be incredible. And something that really helps me put into perspective what I use my time for and how my time is really a proxy for my priorities is therapy. I talk about it all the time pun intended. And it's a really valuable way for me to have some outside perspective on what's going on in my head and my life. And I really, really am grateful I get the chance to go. If you're thinking of starting therapy and you want to do so online, if it's more convenient and flexible and suited to your schedule, if you can't safely access therapy where you are, BetterHelp is a tool I want you to know about. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash spirits today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, hel dot com slash spirits. And now let's get back to the show. Amanda, we are back. And for this Thoth cocktail, I was thinking about the different aspects of Thoth, right? I'm like, do I want some sort of like knowledge themed cocktail? Do I want a bird themed cocktail? We talked about the moon aspect of Thoth a little bit, but I was kind of downplaying it. But as I was searching, I came across a cocktail that was literally called the moon. And not only that, this is a recipe from the famous cocktail bar, Death & Company. Oh, where I went recently. Did you enjoy yourself? I did enjoy myself. I haven't been there yet, but I would really like to try it. I have their their recipe book, but I am just like, but I want to try it in person. I too want to pay $25 for a cocktail. You know, I was surprised as far as cocktails go, they ranged from like 16 to 25, which for craft cocktails in New York City is like, not a thing I'm doing every week, but a price that I sort of expected. So I was pleasantly surprised by that aspect. Yeah, that's that's honestly a very reasonable one. It's like when you start going and you're like, well, all of these are $20 plus. That's when it starts to get a little concerning. But this is a really cool cocktail. I think it's cool. One, it's got the moon aspect. It's from Death and Company. And we already know that Thoth is associated with the afterlife. But this is a gin-based cocktail. It has a Montiato sherry, creme de peche, which is like a um, a peach cream liqueur, and also a honey syrup. So it, it, it's kind of like, it's got the bones of a martini. But instead of being like dry or Ooh. dirty, it's got this kind of like warmth and floralness and a little sweetness to it. It sounds really good. And I feel like peach and gin just go together so well. Yeah, you know, especially like every year. I don't know if it's seasonal or not, but Hendrix puts out these like lunar gins that are incredible and really floral. And I think the peach would really pair well with that. Mm, Yum. So we have these in hand. And besides Thoth's relationship with the moon, not our cocktail, but the actual moon itself. Uh, He has some relationships with the other gods. Uh, We've talked already about his marriage to Ma'at in her episode as well as uh, in this one. But one thing that I didn't mention is that Thoth in his ibis form is said to often lift or fly Ma'at to her father, Ra, which is like very symbolic in that way. Like wisdom will lift justice and order to God. Yeah, I mean, that makes total sense. You can't have just sort of like the blunt hammer of justice without the wisdom to know what's just. Exactly. And I think that's why they they work so well together, both as a couple and as Thoth being someone who upholds the concept of Ma'at. Nice. Again, real wife guy energy. (laughs) (laughs) Appreciative. So Ra is also said to be, for the most part, Thoth's father. Uh, But again, that relationship is not like weird in the divine beings, like non-mortals arena, as we've talked about. Like it's technically incest, but it's not really because these are divine beings. And we've gone through this a million times with Greek mythology. So you all know. The only really other god that is worth mentioning for Thoth in terms of his relationship is uh, Seshat, who we talked about again in the Ma'at episode. But in that, we referred to her as uh, their daughter. But she is also sometimes referred to as his sister or even in some cases Thoth's wife, which I'm not sure if this is like a polygamy thing or if this is like a source in which he is not married to Ma'at, but... In some case, he she is like the consort or wife of Thoth. In all cases, a, a close bond and relationship. 
Exactly. An extremely important one, too. She is referred to as the, Amanda, this is perfect for you, the librarian goddess. Hey. Uh, And it was said that she and Thoth both knew not only the past, but the future. So you asked if he was a historian. Yes, he was, but he can also see the future. I mean, that's pretty good. That's a pretty big power. Yeah, not bad, not bad. Uh, They were said to inscribe a person's fate on the bricks on which their mother gave birth. Oh, shit. Because apparently that's that's how the birthing process would go for most people in ancient Egypt. But also, like, what an image of, like, the the moment you're, you know, you're birthed into the world, your fate is under you like a shadow. Yes, I really like that. Or is, like, inscribed beneath you as you lay there, which is kind of really cool. Yeah, like a plaque. I love that. Uh, not only would they inscribe a person's fate on the bricks, but they were also said to inscribe the length of a king's reign on the leaves of the shed tree, which is the ancient Egyptian equivalent to the tree of life. Wow. Uh, And then also importantly, it was said that Thoth invented language, but it was Sachet who gave it to the people to use. Cool. Uh, We love a a combo. It's very important. (laughs) Yes. And like, imagine you're, you're a moon god at one point. And then you're looking down at those mortals and you're like, they can't even speak to each other. How are we going to make this work? And so, What's going on in those heads of theirs? Like watching your friend's dog be like, what's going on in there? And then Thoth was like, I'm going to invent a language. Like I'm the conlag guy for Game of Thrones. (laughs) (laughs) And then Sachette was like, I'll give it to people so they can actually fucking use it. (laughs) Thank you, honey. So that is his relationship with the other gods. He has some other like kind of complicated ones. But again, these are ones that I want to save for future episodes when we can really dig deep into those. Uh, And the same can be said about some of his foundational stories. I hinted earlier at a story that featured Isis and Horus, which also heavily features Thoth. But again, I think we need to meet that god and goddess first before we tell it. So I'm going to hold off for now. But Thoth does have some other juicy morsels spread through Egyptian mythology. And we're going to start with one of my personal favorites, which is Thoth gambles with the moon. Okay. Now, the version of this story that we have comes from Plutarch, not an actual Egyptian source. So take that with a grain of salt, but it is the only surviving version of this story. So I felt like I had to share this particular one. We'll speculate rampantly. Plutarch paints the Egyptian gods as ones that often quarreled, which feels way more Greek to me, but that's fine. But Thoth was always kind of portrayed as this like mediator. He was the problem solver. He's the one that people went to to like, you know, uh, act as the judge between two fighting gods, right? Mm Mm-hmm. And I'm only stressing this because, again, Thoth is like this literal ideal of a judge. And so they truly believed he would always come down on the right side. The concept of like ma'at and justice. He's always on the side of that. Even if it means telling the king no. Okay, someone has to, Julia. So one day, Ra became angry at his daughter, Newt. Newt is spelled like nut, but it is N-O-O, or like, you know, it sounds like N-O-O-T. He was angry with her because he decreed that she could not have children. Ra and like a lot of the other gods were very happy with how things were going with the world at this point. The sun would rise every day. Crops grew by the Nile. Stars twinkled at night. Everything is great. We don't need to change anything by bringing more gods into the world. They're like, do you know how hard it was to get all of this right? Yes, exactly. And they're like, please don't throw things off balance by adding new gods into the mix. It's just going to make things more complicated. Tough. So he decreed that she could not have children. But Newt was in love with the god Jeb. And the two snuck off together to beat with each other. But they were caught by Ra, who was furious to find that Newt was now pregnant. Mm. So he put a curse upon his daughter, forbidding her to give birth on any of the 360 days of the year. Uh Aha. A really solid curse, by the way. Like, definitely feels like one of those things that if you were not a god, it would be really hard to trick your way out of, right? Yes, but I'm I'm so excited to see how this actually works. Newt knew that Thoth was clever and wise, and so she went to him to see if he could help. And Thoth looked at the situation, and he said, this is not right. What Ra is doing to you is not right. And so he decided to come up with a plan that would allow her to circumvent the curse. But it was a gamble, literally. Oh. So he decided to put up a wager against the moon god, Khonshu. Now, Khonshu is like 
his thing is the moon, whereas Thoth is associated with the moon. Khonshu is sure. like the moon god. Um, so he put up a wager against Khonshu, where Khonshu would wager some of the light of the moon while Thoth wagered all of his knowledge, which is a very powerful wager. Sure. Now, they played a game of Senate, which is kind of like Egyptian backgammon. It was said to be very popular with the gods, both like in terms of playing and also to observe and watch other gods play. Mm -hmm. And Thoth being an extremely wise and strategic god and Khonshu also being a very wise and strategic god, the game went on for a very long time. Like they drew a crowd of gods to watch the game happen. It was very cool. Um, but Thoth ends up winning. Khonshu loses. And so Thoth receives one seventy seconds of the moon's light, which allows mm. him to create five extra days in the year. Nice. Because he was like, well... Ra, when you made this curse, you said she can't give birth on any of the 360 days. But what if there were five extra days? Incredible. In those five extra days, Newt is able to give birth to her five children. Osiris, Isis, Set, Nephthys, and Horus, which is a different Horus than uh, the one that Isis would give birth to. He's referred to as Horus the Elder. Okay, cute. Well, Egyptian mythology would be very different if she weren't able to have those kids. And I'm glad she didn't have to remain pregnant for like four years or something until a leap year. That would have been disastrous. Yeah, that would have been that would have been a rough one. Yeah, for sure. And also, like we've seen in uh, ancient Greek mythology as well, that like the punishment of like making women stay pregnant is a very common one in mythology for some reason. I mean, sound off uh, people who have given birth in the in the comments, but I, I feel like most people, by the time they're about to give birth, are like, yep, I'm, I'm going to tap out. I'm good. I'm good. I've definitely seen that of uh, my friends who have been pregnant, where they're like, just, I'm done. I'm done. Just let, get out of me already. <laughs> now, Julia, I do have to tell you that every time you relay to me a story of gods uh, wagering or playing a game, I am just fan casting Mario Kart in my head. Um, and so I am imagining <laughs> these two gods sitting down with their uh, wireless uh, Wii controllers or Nintendo Switch or what have you uh, and just going at it, meaning, you know, Toad and DK or something. Oh, Amanda, please tell me who you think Thoth and Kanchu would main in Mario Kart, please. <sighs> I mean, Thoth has got to be... Who's wise? Julia, I think I'm going to say Diddy Kong, Donkey Kong Jr., uh, for Thoth. Interesting. Um, just because he's the handsomest monkey I can think of. <laughs> uh, and let's see. Is it King Boo? He just feels, like, vindictive enough to set that kind of curse. Yeah, Ra, Ra would be kind of King Boo energy for sure. And Kanchi's just there having a great time. So I think he's like Luigi. Yeah, or like yeah. Yoshi. Yeah. Yoshi's always having a good time at the race. Why not? Why not? I'm into I it. I like it. All right. Thank you for playing along with that. So Thoth is the reason why we have the 365-day calendar. It's because of this story and allowing uh, Newt to give birth to her children. Love it. Now, there is another story that really solidifies Thoth's reputation for uh, basically knowing all of the secrets of the universe. He is not central to this, but it does kind of like make a lot of references to him. So this story is kind of framed as a, a storytelling competition. There is a king that is named King Khufu, and he asks his son to tell him stories. So one of them, whose name is uh, Hard of Deaf, tells this one, it's a, it's a contemporary tale. It takes place during his father's reign. And he informs his father of a miracle maker who lives in the land of Egypt. And his name is Jedi. And among his powers is the ability to reattach an animal's severed head, tame lions and other dangerous animals, and to know the exact number of secret chambers in Thoth's sanctuary. That's a very varied list. Yes, yes. Do you want to dig into any particular one or? Okay, so taming lions, I feel like I know how you get there. Uh, you, sure. Someone have a re reputation to be like, wow, he is so good at taming horses, dogs, cats, whatever, or like dangerous animals. Fine. Reattaching an animal's severed head. Again, that feels like a myth that could form around somebody where, you know, either something was healed or you saw it weird or they did some kind of bait and switch of like, look, your pet is totally fine or whatever. Um, but I... I don't know how you set yourself up as knowing the exact number of secret chambers in Thoth's sanctuary. Interesting. Well, I the story kind of gives you an explanation. So, 
Okay. The son tells his father about this miracle worker, right? And so the king is like, this person seems dope. Um, I would mm -hmm. like him brought to the palace immediately. And so he calls him to the palace. He orders for a goose, an ox, a aquatic fowl, and a criminal to all be beheaded in front of this miracle worker so that he can work his miracle and show the king that he can do the thing about the, the severed heads, right? Okay, I feel like you start with the animal taming because no animals have to be beheaded to do that. But Not as impressive, on. I think, you know? <laughs> so Tough. the king asks Jetty to decapitate the criminal and then reattach his head. And this guy is like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> That's also a person. That's a person. I will, however, do that for the animals. And so he does that. He decapitates the animals and then performs the, the miracle of reattaching their heads and bringing them back to life. Uh, everyone in the room is in awe. They are like, that's incredible. Wow. I mean, yeah, I would be too. And also probably that, that poor person is like, thank God. Good. Yeah, that criminal is like, this could have been bad for me. <laughs> yeah. So after this, the king is like, oh, well, my son also says that you know about the Sanctuary of Thoth. And Jetty is like, I mean, no, you're kind of wrong. And he's like, what's up? He's like, well, I don't know the number of chambers in Thoth's sanctuary, but I do know their whereabouts, you know? So this is kind of when the story turns into a prophecy mm. because the king asks, he's like, well, where are the exact whereabouts of Thoth's secret chambers? And Jetty tells him that it's like, it's not for me to say. <laughs> that's that's secret information. I can't tell you what, like, I know just because I know it. Pretty ballsy to say that to a king. And I kind of love it. This is coming immediately after performing a clear miracle right in front of the king. Like, you know, your your ability to say no to a king is never going to be higher than that moment, in my opinion. At this point, he's like, I'm not going to tell you that, but I will tell you a prophecy because like the god Thoth has shared this with me. OK, prophecy is a pretty good plan B. Yeah. So he says the prophecy is this. There is a woman in the country of Egypt. Her name is Regidet. So this woman will give birth to three godly boys who will become kings. Wow. And <laughs> this is where the story ends because uh. <laughs> we've lost the rest of the manuscript. Oh, no. <laughs> but this like basically it is implied that he gives the names of the boys and it is like heavily implied that this ends up being like the the fifth dynasty is like an sure. origin story for the fifth dynasty of kings that would come during this period of time. Um, I, you got to hate a historical cliffhanger, Julia, because uh, we're never going to know. No, we're never going to know. And that, hey, that's OK. There are worse things in the world of, of us not knowing, you know. Are there? <laughs> well, I would say Thoth would say, hey, you're a mortal. You're not supposed to know everything. Uh, that's fair. That's fair. Unless you want to become one of his initiates and then you can read those 42 books. <sighs> Very tempting. That's like the end of the stories that I have. There is another story that Thoth features in that I kind of hinted at earlier in this episode that we'll be definitely covering on our Horus episode. But Thoth is key in healing the Eye of Horus that was destroyed by Horus's rival set. And I'm very excited to talk about that one. It's, an, again, another reason that he is associated so closely with both Osiris and with Horus and gets to wear, like, Horus's eye on his, his clothing. But much like the cliffhanger that I gave you from that manuscript, I'm also leaving this on a little bit of a cliffhanger. Well, it sounds like we've gotten our primer on Thoth. Now we know a lot more about where he comes from, what his deal is, what his domain is. And so when he pops up in other stories, I'll be like, oh, yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, you know, this is, uh, that's Thoth. He's our god of scribes and sacred texts. He's the science as well as magic, mathematics, and the moon. And the Greeks would later tie him to the idea of, like, Hermes, because mm. a lot of that, like, kind of back and forth between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead. Uh, but I think he plays, like, almost a more interesting role than Hermes does in the uh, Olympians. He is a god that seeks justice for others. He is a devoted husband, and he is clever in so many ways. And I think that is something that we should highlight and appreciate about Thoth, especially as we see him in later stories. Right on. Well, thank you for introducing us, Julia, and I'm excited to hear more stories in the Egyptian series. Yes, the long name that we picked for the Egyptian series. Because, Julia, denial isn't just a river in Egypt. It's what we've been doing by keeping an Egyptian mythology series from you on Spirit's Podcast. That is true. But the next time you are wading through the Nile and 
and uh, look up at the moon. Remember, stay creepy. Stay cool. Stay cool.